James is working uh, in the automation team and he describes his own job as, I quote, improving interoperability through testing. So James has worked for Opera. He is a British citizen, but he also has a Swedish card. And I've been told that he was especially fond of hamburgers, but the very good one. So please welcome James. Okay, we're just having uh, some minor technical problems getting the, getting the slides working. But uh, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, testing for the web. So uh, the web, I think, I hope everybody in this room can agree, is, is pretty great. It's got a lot of things going for it. Uh, it's vendor neutral. You can implement it on any device. You don't have to go out to someone and get permission to uh, distribute your content on the web. Uh, but it also has a number of problems. So uh, one of the problems that I think we've, uh, we've uh, really uh, seen recently with the rise of uh, mobile operating systems is that the web doesn't necessarily have all the features that other platforms have. Uh, so it might performance or it, it might not have access to hardware. Uh, and there's a pretty simple solution to that. Uh, which is that you go, okay, we need this, bit, this, this extra feature, uh, let's go and convince some browser vendors to implement it, let's get together and write a spec and, and let's do it. So we know, we know how to do that. Uh, but there's another problem uh, with the web, which seems to sort of be fundamental to the whole model, that, uh, well, if you've ever developed a website, you've probably found that you developed it in one browser, and uh, then you tried it in some other browser, and it didn't quite work. Uh, and that, that's a bit more of a problem. Um, and this is, this is really something that's been going on for a long time. You know, uh, 10 years ago or more, we were getting best displayed in Netscape 4 or whatever. And then we got best displayed in Internet Explorer and then best displayed in WebKit and Internet Explorer isn't going to work at all. Um, so this is something we'd really like to fix. Uh, so what's the process for doing this? Well, uh, typically, if we have bugs and we want to fix them, then, then the first step is, is to write a test. Uh, so maybe the right uh, solution to, to improving the web here is to write some tests uh, that we can use to say, well, there's a bug, we need to fix it, and you, we can all see what it is. Okay, and people have written tests before. You might recognize these. These are, the, these are two of the ACID tests, and uh, they were written mainly by Ian Hickson, who now edits the HTML spec. Uh, and the idea was that they would test a whole bunch of things together uh, so that when you uh, implemented a whole load of different features and, and fixed maybe some bugs that you had, uh, then you would render the ACID test uh, the way that it was intended. So the top one is, is ACID 2, and if, if you got that right, you would get the smiley face, and the bottom one is ACID 3, and you would get this 100 out of 100. Uh, if you did it right. And they were great. They really uh, encouraged people to uh, think about web standards and, and uh, uh, compete on implementing features at a time when that wasn't really uh, maybe as much of a priority as it is today. Um, but they also had a few problems. So one of the problems is that an acid test is very sort of self-contained thing. Like once it's finished, it's done. And you can't like go, oh, well, I found this other bug. I want to, I want to add it to the test and make browsers all fail again because, because they'd be pretty annoyed at you if you did that. Uh, and so it wasn't really possible for, for people to con contribute to them. Uh, and also they, they kind of set some weird incentives because people wanted to... Uh, do well for them for marketing, uh, they would often make quite shallow implementations of the features and just do enough uh, to pass the test. And this, this was a particular problem with ACID 3, actually, uh, because there were a couple of browser vendors really competing to see who could be the first to release a build that got 100 out of 100. Uh, and, and so there were stories of people literally just putting in stub methods that sort of did you know, return true for this but don't actually implement the feature at all. Uh, so in that sense, uh, we'd like to do a bit better. Uh, so 
the question is, what, what do we really mean by better? So uh, what would be an ideal test suite for the web? Well, it, sh it should certainly be automated or automatable. And uh, what I mean by this is that it should be possible to uh, either from within the browser or by scripting the browser from the outside, work out what the result of the test was uh, without um, actually having a human involved. And uh, so I'm in the tools and automation team, so I kind of have a vested interest in this. Uh, but the way that I like to explain it is that if we have an automated test, we can run it 100 times a day easily. We can put it on our continuous integration hardware and run it 100 times a day. If we have a manual test that requires somebody to sit down and actually do it, uh, we can probably run it once every 100 days because we just can't afford to employ all the people to run these tests. And it sounds pretty obvious, but actually this is something we've got wrong in the past. So, for example, CSS 2.1 spec had a big test suite, hundreds of manual tests, impossible to run. It took one person two full days to run it. Uh, so the result is that nobody does. Uh, it should be vendor neutral. So it should be possible to write a test in this and see if it passes in Gecko and Blink and WebKit and IE and uh, Servo in the future and whatever other... Uh, engines you, you care about. And again, it kind of sounds obvious. Uh, you know, the web is supposed to be a sort of vendor neutral platform, but actually at the moment, every browser vendor has their own test suites and uh, they're completely separate and they typically depend on proprietary features. So for example, Blink and WebKit have a type of test called a fast layout test, which actually dumps internal data structures and then compares it to the expected internal data structures. And because they're different to the internal data structures of Gecko, we can't use those tests. And the similar tests that we have that they can't use. Uh, it should be possible to run in continuous integration. So this sort of follows on from the point about uh, automation, uh, it being automated. And uh, more than it should be possible to run in continuous integration, it should actually be run in continuous in integration. We should do everything we can from the start to make sure that this is something that browser vendors will put on their, their uh, test systems and run hundreds of times a day. So we need to make sure that it's got a completely replicatable environment uh, so that when you write a test, uh, it, it's exactly the same as when the browser vendor runs it, so they actually see the, the fail that they expected. And it also means that we ha have to have a certain quality standard. We have to have tests that always produce the same results so that we're not continually having to work out, well, did it just fail because the test was a bit dodgy? Uh, and the last point is anybody can contribute. And this is kind of the central point of my talk, that actually it's not just people that work at browser vendors that might want to uh, contribute to this or people who you know, work on browsers in their spare time, although those are uh, also great people to contribute. But if you develop a website, you might be the best person to, to contribute a test for something because it's quite likely that you will come across a bug at some point uh, and you will see uh, a rendering difference between two browsers and then you might be you know, the, the person in the world who has, who has found this bug. And so it would be great if, if you could also be the person that causes it to be fixed so that nobody else ever has to find it again. So it sounds like what I'm describing is basically an open source project uh, for, for tests. And so that's what, uh, that's what we've created. Uh, so in this, in this case, we is basically the W3C uh, who are sort of coordinating the effort uh, in the sense that they're providing some infrastructure for it and, and uh, they own this brand, Test the Web Forward. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Test the Web Forward before. Uh, it's uh, historically been used to describe a series of events that were originally run by uh, Adobe, where people would turn up and they would learn how to write a test for the web platform, and then uh, they would contribute their test. Uh, so previously, Test the Web Forward was these events. Now it's actually the, the sort of brand name for the whole project. And uh, obviously, it has a website, testthewebforward.org, and so if you literally listen to nothing else I say for the rest of the talk, but you remember testthewebforward.org, uh, then that's really all you need to know, because everything else I'm going to say is covered on that site in much more detail. Um, OK, so it, it's an open source project. We're running it like a typical open source project. We have a GitHub page. Uh, it's a bit hard to read on the screen, but uh, there's a re repository 
uh, in the W3C uh, organization called Web Platform Tests, where we have all the tests for almost everything. There's only two uh, sort of parts of the web platform, really, where we're not collecting the tests in this repository. Uh, one of them is, is JavaScript itself, because it's uh, run at ECMA, and it has its own test suite already. Uh, we haven't taken JavaScript tests. And the second one is uh, CSS. And the reason for this is basically historical legacy. Uh, there's, a, there's a separate repository uh, for CSS tests, uh, and that's because they took testing seriously uh, earlier than quite a lot of other kind of W3C working group type people. Uh, and so they have their own infrastructure, which their tests depend on, uh, but nobody else's use. And so we're working on migrating the CSS stuff over to this web platform test repository, uh, but we're not quite there yet. And uh, so uh, as is typical for, for GitHub, we just use the normal GitHub workflow. If you want to contribute a test or if you want to fix a test or something, you just create a pull request and uh, then it will get code reviewed. And uh, when it's all right, then we'll integrate it into the repository. OK, so that's uh, enough kind of background. Let's actually get on and write a test. Uh, so, so as I've said, it's documented on testthewebforward.org. Testthewebforward.org is another GitHub repository. Uh, you can contribute documentation fixes. Uh, that's a very useful con uh, contribution if that's what you're into. Uh, but to write a test, we need an example of something that's broken, really, because if you're a web developer, this is uh, this is the most likely kind of scenario uh, that you're going to be in. So the example I have here is, is with an API called File Reader. And if you haven't used File Reader, don't worry the de about the details of it. Uh, you just need to know that um, it has this method called abort on it. Basically, a file reader is something you can use to access the contents of, uh, say, a file that's been picked through input type equals file. And in our example, what we see is that we create a file reader, and then immediately we, we call this abort method. And in uh, Firefox and, and in Blink-based browsers, two different things happen. So Firefox here will, will throw an error, uh, whereas uh, uh, Blink-based browsers will, uh, will just continue without throwing an error. And so obviously, these behaviors can't both be right. So uh, what are you going to do? Well, you might then think, OK, so which is the right behavior? So you put file reader spec into your favorite search engine, and uh, you probably come, up, come back with something like this. Uh, and it, it's, it's quite hard to read on here, but this is, this is a W3C specification for, um, for, fi for the file API. But there is a trap. Uh, typically, the, the search results that end up at the, at the top of um, Google, certainly, are for what the W3C calls TR versions of documents. And these are always out of date. It, it really helps if you just think that TR stands for totally wrong. So um, whenever, you see a, whenever you see a TR uh, document, you should look for the bit that says latest editor's draft, and you should click on that instead, because that's the only way to be sure that you're reading the right version of the spec. Uh, so just to emphasize it, OK, uh, this is a little hard to read. OK, so then we, we find the, the right version of the spec, and we find the bit about the abort method. And it says, when the abort method is called, the user agent must run the steps below. If ready state equals empty, or if ready state equals done, set result to null and terminate this overall set of steps without doing anything else. Well, OK, ready state, it turns out here, if we follow the link that's in the spec, uh, is actually uh, set to empty when the file reader is first created, and we haven't done anything that will change ready state yet. So it's empty here, and, and this first step applies. And then it says, so set result to null and terminate this overall set of steps. OK, so that, that tells us that, well, it doesn't tell us that we have to throw an error. So clearly what Firefox is doing here is wrong, and what the other browsers are doing are, is right. So now we're going to turn our, our sort of uh, miniature example into a proper test case that's ready for submission. Uh, so this is our example from before, uh, just put into a document. And the first thing we need is, is a little bit of boilerplate. So we have this script, uh, testharness.js, uh, which is, uh, provides the sort of testing framework. It's uh, quite specific to this, this test suite. 
Uh, it's not uh, something that people have really used in other JavaScript uh, frameworks, and that's basically because it's designed with testing browsers in mind. So that's why we haven't reused whichever other JavaScript library you've previously heard of. And we also have this file called testharnessreport.js, and that's basically to help browser vendors integrate this in their continuous integration system. So that file is for them to do whatever they like with in order to report the results back. And then we have a little bit more. We have this uh, div ID equals log, and that's just somewhere to dump human readable output so that you can tell whether, te whether the test passed or failed. Uh, OK, and then one more thing that a test needs is a title. In this case, we're only going to have one test on the page, so we can just uh, add a title element, and that will provide the test title. OK, and then uh, the last step, or almost the last step, is, is to turn the, the uh, code in, into an actual test. It turns out testharness.js provides this function test, which itself takes a, takes a function. And if the, the function that you call it with uh, runs without throwing any errors, then the test passes. And if it throws an error, then the test fails. So in this case, that turns out to be exactly what we want. So we, we can literally just strip out all the, the try-catch stuff, and we, we immediately have our test. Uh, and the reason for having this, this thing where we pass in a function is that it allows us to isolate different, uh, different tests on the page from each other. Uh, so that we can uh, have multiple tests on the page and they won't interfere too much. So that's a valid test. We could submit that at this point, but we can do a little bit better and we can see a few more features. So if we look back at the spec, it said, uh, if ready state equals empty, set result to null. So it turns out, if, if we read about what result is here, result is an attribute of this file read object. So if, if uh, implementation is really compliant with the spec, then at the end of this process, we should have result equals null. So we can add a, a test in for that. So testharness.js, it provides uh, a lot of assert functions of the type that you might be used to if you've used a lot of other kind of X unit type um, <laughs> testing frameworks. Uh, in this case, we just want assert equals and we just assert that reader.result is null. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, if it's not null, then this will actually throw a, an assertion error and the test will fail. Uh, of course, we have more than just assert equals. In fact, uh, one of the design goals has been to have quite a rich range of uh, assertion API, APIs so that instead of everybody having to reinvent their own way of testing things, uh, we can just use pre-written functions. So for example, if the right behavior here had been to throw, then there would be assert throws uh, already provided for you, and you would just pass that a function uh, that you would expect to throw, and you could tell it, I expect this function to throw this kind of error, and it would do all those checks for you. You wouldn't have to write any try-catch blocks or anything. And similarly, there's things like assert regex equals, assert array equals, and so on, for more complicated kinds of checks. So that's great. We've actually there, in just a few minutes, gone from uh, having a, a difference between browsers to having a test. Uh, we need to run the test. And uh, you might think, well, this is a bit problematic. If I want to run it on my system, I've got these paths to uh, slash resources, which um, doesn't really exist on, on my computer, maybe. Uh, so how am I going to check it? Well, as I said before, one of the uh, big goals that we had was to make the test system very self-contained. So we actually distribute in the repository uh, a web server and a WebSocket server that um, are specially designed for writing test cases. And there's a setup script uh, so that when you run it, you get uh, them launched in the right configuration. So if you, if you go to the uh, the repository and, and read the readme file, then basically all you have to do is you have to set up your uh, exet hosts uh, to have the right domain names on your local system, and then everything will work just like it would on a browser vendor system. So there's no like fiddling with Apache or ModPHP or, or any of this uh, stuff that's, that's a complete pain. 
uh, and then we can actually run our test. And uh, I don't really believe in demos because they always go wrong. Uh, so here's, um, here's, here's one I made earlier. Uh, this is it in uh, Chrome where it passes. Uh, and this is it uh, in Firefox where it fails. And before you run out and, and file a bug, there is already a bug filed. Uh, and it, in fact, already has a patch in it. So hopefully uh, in the near future, I'm going to need to find a new example to use in, in this kind of talk. Uh, because this one will be fixed. Okay, so now that we've uh, got a we've got a test uh, and we've checked that it works, we can submit our test. Uh, at that point, uh, somebody, uh, for example, me or one of or one of the other people that works on this, will do code review of the test, and eventually it will get integrated into the repository. Okay, so my, uh, my example test there was a JavaScript test, which is the best type to write whenever you can, but sometimes you can't and you need to test something that depends on uh, layout. Uh, and when you want to do that, uh, the, process, the test type we have is called a ref test. What you do here is you make two different pages that when the test passes should render the same and when the test fails should render differently. So typically what you might do is say you have a test involving Flexbox, you would make one page uh, use uh, Flexbox and say render a green square and one page use just normal positioning and render the same green square. Uh, and then obviously when Flexbox is broken, the, you won't get a green square, you'll get something else. So that's how we automate tests that can't be simply automated through JavaScript but depend on layout. And when we can't do that either, uh, we finally resort to manual tests. But this is really a last resort. And in the future, we're hoping to replace all the manual tests with, or as many manual tests as possible, with web driver tests. So if you have uh, experience working with web driver, sort of Selenium, uh, then uh, you know we we ha have a job for you, uh, converting tests. OK, so that's what, what you can do for vendors. Uh, but what about vendors? Are they holding up their side of the bargain? Are they actually running these tests yet? Uh, well, uh, the news is, is good, uh, although we're not all the way there yet. So at Mozilla, we now have these tests. We have some of the tests running on production, and we have the full test suite uh, now running on our staging servers, so as of last week. And on Linux, we're getting like uh, four or five uh, tests that are unexpectedly uh, erroring on each run. On other platforms, there's more, so there's, there's more work still to do. But certainly in the near future, we're going to be running all these tests, and we, we have scripts so that we can update it uh, almost as soon as new tests are accepted. Uh, I've also seen work in WebKit and uh, heard about work in in Blink to get this running. So it definitely looks like, uh, at least for the open source browser vendors that I know about, uh, sort of within the first half of this year, everybody should be running this complete test suite uh, on, their, um, on their sort of continuous integration setup. Obviously, knowing what, say, Microsoft are doing is a bit harder. OK, so the last point I have is, is that if you're here, you're a great person to write a test. And you should really want to write tests for this test suite. If you're a web developer, then writing tests is a way to ensure that the web sucks less in the future. Uh, it's a way to ensure that the bug that you found today isn't still a bug you know, six browser versions later. And that's doubly true if you're uh, writing some sort of JavaScript framework. Uh, in my ideal world, if you were writing a JavaScript framework, you would have a policy that every time you, you had to hack around uh, two different browsers having different behaviors, you would write a test. Uh, we would uh, provide you with a link that told you when, when, uh, what the behavior of that test was in the latest version of each uh, browser. And then as soon as it uh, passed in all the browsers that you supported, you could remove your hack and you could be completely confident that that was OK to do. Uh, but if you're just uh, an open source developer or, and you're interested in getting involved in spec work or you're interested in getting involved in browser work in particular, writing tests is a really great way to, to learn about uh, web specs and how they work. And it's a really great way of getting involved in uh, browser uh, development without necessarily diving straight into C++ code or something. Okay, that's all I have to say. So if anybody has any questions... Uh, now would be a great time. 
And uh, please use the microphone uh, when you ask questions so that it uh, appears on the recording. Hi. Um, to what extent is this uh, testing framework geared um, exclusively around rendering and browsing uh, um, display side of things? And to what extent will it also cover things like uh, network connection handling, say F uh, FTP of HTTP, think protocol differences like um, expect and continue, um, newer stuff like speedy and all that kind of stuff? Okay, so um, basically the idea is that uh, with the exception of the two examples that I had earlier, we're prepared to accept... I think any test that you can that you can write that is uh, done in a way that is completely exposed to to standard uh, like web APIs. So if you can test it in, in a way that's browser independent um, and uh, you know doesn't rely on specific uh, features of each browser to to get uh, low level information out or something, then then that's absolutely fine to put in this test suite as far as I'm concerned. So, I mean, I, I would certainly be happy to accept, like, speedy tests or something. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how the, the working group for that feel about it, but certainly I think the best thing to do would be to put it in this test suite. Yeah. Uh, I mean. Does that include performance tests as well as just functional tests? Uh, so far, we have... Uh, exclusively done functional tests, so things that we can give a pass or fail to. I think performance testing is is difficult. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm certainly I believe in performance testing. Uh, I'm not sure that it would necessarily uh, fit well into this, but it's definitely something that uh, I think a lot of us would like to have a more, you know, have a have a centralised. Uh, place to put that sort of thing. So I'm sorry it's going to be the, the only question because uh, we are a little bit late and there are a lot of people who want to come as well for the next uh, next talk. So what I propose you, because I understand you have a lot of questions, um, James I'm sure will yep. be ready to answer to your questions outside of the of the room. Thank you James. Thanks a lot. Thank you.